Pillars podcast. Five Pillars of Mad Monarch production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers, sisters, friends, and yes, the foes as well. I pray you're all well and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers podcast with your host, Didi Hussein. And today I'm, again, quite upset. I feel empty when I don't have my blood brother with me. But I do have someone who's kind of a blood brother to me. Um, the most fakest guy from Hackney you'll ever meet. The most pseudo foe <laughs> alpha male you'll probably ever meet. The most Pakistani looking Greek you'll ever meet. <laughs> and he also happens to be the CEO of Aira, Hamza Zotse. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This. I feel there's some tension between us. <laughs> no, not at all, bro. Not at you all. You weren't saying that to me before it's the camera it's, it's all love. It's all love, yeah. yeah. Should we just get something out of the way? <laughs> no, seriously, let's just get something out of the way. Because I need to get it off my chest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Let's have the arm wrestle. <laughs> Are you going to beat me? Huh? You're going to beat me? Let's do it. Yeah, sure, why not? You ready? Left hand or right hand first? I don't know. Which of your hands are more active? <laughs> oh, for God's sake. <laughs> I, I asked you a simple Well, because question. I'm a Wing Chun artist, <laughs> both of them. Because oh, I'm a Wing Chun artist. Yeah, you use both of them, isn't it? I'm... Isn't that so as doing all this? Eh? Yeah, carry on. We'll get to your credentials in a bit. Yeah? Right hand. Well, I was a Wing Chun artist. Okay. Right hand? Yeah, why not? Let's go. So. <clears throat> Don't pretend you're a novice to this. Yeah, but that, that's your left hand, right? No, that's my right hand. Oh, really? Yeah. You're allowed to hold that. Okay. So push it here? No, you can do it here or there. You can't use the body weight. No body weight? No, it's so just... you let Mohammed Hijab do that? He cheated. Okay. My hand's a bit sweaty, That's so... That's fine. Okay. But it's your podcast. I have to let you win, right? No, you don't. Oh, my God. That's a big bicep. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. So can you explain to me why I have to play to your elbow? You're not playing to my elbow. What do you mean by playing to the Ready? elbow? Ready? You call it. Wait, wait, I'm a bit high here. Get comfortable, because I'm not letting you use any excuse if I do win. Okay, sure. No, but I'm going to let you win, so... No, you can't. Then forget about no, it. No, I won't. All right. Then forget about it, then, Relax, bro. I'll be just. Wait, wait. Let's do that. One, two, three. That was good, bro. You did well. Left hand. No, I'm Man, I bless you, bro. <sighs> that was hard work, man. That was hard work. Yeah. Well, now we've got that fat chest. <laughs> <laughs> Is that already okay now, yeah? Audio, man. What's that saying? Can I have my script, please? Of course you'll have your script. <laughs> now nah, he's going to be even more mean to me. <laughs> oh, dear. That's not how I envisaged it to start. I was hoping I'd win. So look. Must have been um, the milkshake I had yesterday. Okay. Look, man, I've seen you on other podcasts, B. Yep. And um, with all due respect to all the brothers that are doing great work in the podcasting field, it's the same things you're discussing, man. You may, you may not feel that because you're passionate about those things. Right? Absolutely, yeah. So things about uh, the last one with the, some brother, you talked about being an alpha male, you're talking about studies, that hour. Oh, I didn't really describe myself as an alpha male. But no, no, but, but there were some topics that were touched about. Okay, sure, male, yeah. Like the diet and all that kind of stuff. I've seen it. It's okay. the same stuff. And, and I don't want to talk about any of that. I agree. I don't want to talk about you. Let's bring out the real me, yeah? Yeah, so you've been on the journey. If you follow a chronology. Yep. Uh, forgive my sensationalised chronology. It's alright, you're a yellow journalist, That's so it's fine. fine. That's fine. I'd rather be a yellow journalist than a white journalist. But, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't mean yellow by the, your skin colour. Yellow that's journalism fine. means like yeah, cheap know, journalism. Yeah, 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 okay, that's fine. Uh, convert, stint with the Hizb, Hitin, Aira, CEO. Yep. Is that fair? Well, I'm sort missing. of. Yeah? Yeah. Would you say you've matured over the years? Matured? <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a loaded question. Okay, fine. Have you changed? I've transformed. Oh, okay. I think change is a big word. Transformations are a little bit more subtle, I think. As John Ware put, have you been on a journey to road to Damascus? A road to Damascus? Yeah. I've had epiphanies, that's for sure. I think... Look, when people start in the Dawah, mm. 
especially in my context when it was like the early noughties, 2005, 2004, 2005, 2006, it was a kind of juncture period where you had social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and it was growing. And we didn't really have people around us to advise us much. And to be very honest with you, bro, in the beginning, it was a lot about the ego. We think we're doing something for Islam, but in many cases it was, you know, maybe just a little bit of showing off, maybe, or did, ego. Did you fall into that? Absolutely, bro. Absolutely. Okay. So it is, it is a regret. Yeah, bro. Yeah, I, that took out a lot out of me, bro. <clears throat> it took a lot out of me. So. Okay. so, 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 you felt there was a lot of ego boosting, yeah. which then questioned your. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the whole thing, but look, I think one of the fundamental things that people who engage in public work have to realize that this is actually work for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You have to do it with the class. So you have Interesting changed. period. Yeah, I mean, look. This, I'm not saying I have a class now because it, to say that that's one of the signs of not having a class, right? Mm. But I think you're more aware of maybe yourself, you're more self aware, you're taking conscious snapshots of who you are and you're understanding your motivations. Maybe you're taking a step back a little bit more and you're basically a little bit more conscious of. Conscious of what? Of what Allah wants from me, you. you know, there are some, many things that I would like to do, but I don't because I don't think Allah wants that from me. Would you say your conscious also tells you to do things and don't do things with regards to the wider perception of non-Muslims and the mainstream media? And yeah, I mean, look, the the right question we must ask ourselves all the time in public work is not what do I want from this situation? What does Allah want from me in this situation? That means you have to examine the context and the variables, what Islam says, what Allah says, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. I know you're going to come and <laughs> try to smash me down on this, but it's very important to understand that and also to understand the moral variables and even, yes, the maslaha. That's, but you know, maslaha is one of those things that has been excessively used yeah absolutely I agree I, I'm more of a ga gazalian when it comes to Maslaha and then, so he had three principles and then Taim Yun depending on who the audience is right and no, not really because they yeah. agreed on many things uh, yeah. but, but I'm just saying you do tend to just play to audiences right <laughs> no I don't and, that's and, a slanderous accusation and, and then regret it afterwards <laughs> no that is a slanderous accusation so just say it's not true then I won't say in, it. in many of my talks I always mention them both together deliberately yeah. because uh, in the Ummah as you know so you can't get accused of, of being no, not at all. You, not yeah. at all. I have my positions, which I'll articulate today. Yeah. But I think what the issue is, is that people think that we own these scholars, like right? certain sects or groups. Like, is this a bit where you say we're standing on the shoulders of giants? Well, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. But I'm saying you say it a lot. Because it's true. Maybe find a different way to say it. I know the truth is very hard for journalists like yourself, yeah. Oh, Habibi, but I'm just saying to you. Look. Listen, Habibi. The point is, I deliberately wow. mention Al Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah. May Allah's mercy be on both I mean. of them, because they are they are representations of certain th schools of thoughts, if you like, or schools of creed. And they are, in my view, they are misrepresented by both sides of the camp, if you like. Yeah. And I think Islam is a little bit more fluid that way, and they agreed on many, many things. Sure. In, in actual fact, Ibn Taymiyyah actually quotes Al Ghazali on certain issues, and I believe it's to do with the contingency argument, to so. do with the, the, you know contingency. So, you know, for us to say that you are, you, you know, if you follow this scholar, you have to be X, and if you follow that scholar, you have to be Y, is unnuanced and not in line with the classical tradition. Okay, let's allow the digress. I don't want to be hearing this stuff here. I agree with you. Let's go back to the fact that many within the Ummah think that you have changed, you become soft. And quite frankly, the fiery Hamza that we once did know and people saw Izza and empowerment from, you're just not that guy no more because you're frankly scared. Really? Yeah, really? Yeah. That's interesting. I don't know. Read the comment section on your Facebook page, the ones that you don't delete. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even much. I, I don't use social media that much. Yeah, of course you don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, seriously though, look. <laughs> Has, no, look so, so, have you left the debating scene? No, of course not. So in actual fact... Look, the last debate I had, I think, was about two years ago in Ireland with the head of Atheist Island. Yeah. I think his name is Michael Nugent. And that debate was filmed and he started first. So he had the typical strategy that some use, which is it's like a machine gun strategy. You're just going to yeah. fire bullets everywhere. Yeah. So he came up with so many different contentions and issues concerning theism in general. Mm. I couldn't address every single question 
right, in 20 minutes. So I try to transcend the debate by saying, in actual fact, you've misrepresented even the Western philosophical tradition because I've, I'm studying that tradition now, I'm back into academia. And then not to say that, I'm not trying to show off, I'm trying to make a point. And the point is... Wing Chun, academia. No, the point in that de debate was, bro, was to uh, try and undermine his questions yeah. by showing that the very premise of his questioning so flawed, was flawed for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. He didn't even put it up. Why did you say Z? You're not American. Z. Good. So he d he didn't put it online, yeah. right? So I'm not um, a debate shy. For example, when I was in South Africa a few years ago, they arranged a debate with me with one of the academics in South a radio, Africa. A radio debate, right? No, no, it was going to be a debate at university. I think it was in Cape Town. If, okay. if I don't, if... But something happened on a radio show. So no, but what happened here was, is this person went on a radio show. When he found out he was going to debate me, then he pulled out. Ah. Do you see? Now, I don't know why. I don't know the true reasons why he pulled out. Maybe it's because of my past experience with, with inter, interlocutors or whatever the case may be. Mm. Maybe he felt that maybe my style, if you like, mm. would you know, overpower him. So I'm not afraid of debates. But now it's not about having debates for the sake of debates. Because I don't believe debates is the Dao strategy. It's I believe it's one of the means. And you have to use it very carefully. Was Krauss a debate for the sake of debate? No, not really. From, from what I remember, and obviously to retrospectively think about things, it's very hard to understand what my motivations truly were five years ago, bro. Mm -hmm. yeah? It's like nearly five years now. But the debate with Krauss, one of the strategies is was to pick someone who was, was seen as a potential figurehead, big, figurehead yeah. in... in in the discourse, in you know the new atheist movement, he wrote a book on a universe from nothing. Yeah, it was slightly getting popularized. I think they wanted him to be like a replacement for Hitchens, yep. and all of that stuff, right? And I think that even, that was even before Hitchens does, Hitchens died. I don't remember, but Hitchens was ill anyway, so they said like someone needs to replace one of the four horsemen, if you like, or yeah. whatever the case may be. Mad. Anyway, yeah. and this all from what I remember, I, it, 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 it's a bit grey. But the issue is, so if Dawkins or de Sam debates, Harris called you debates out. are important. Yeah. Well, Sam Harris did call me out once. Okay. So uh, we had a Twitter discussion. I had a Twitter discussion, and he was involved somehow. It was on Facebook, and then we end up emailing each other. And and Sam Harris said, "Let's have an email debate." Mm. And I said, fine, I'll email debate you, but it will be on ontological issues, meaning, you know, the, the, the source and the foundations, foundations. of our morality mm. and our worldview. He said, no, I want to debate you on, let's start with this particular hukum, this particular law. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm not going to do that. Because so let's start with talking about the windows, not the house or the foundation. Basically. Okay. And he was like, we could start with this, then we go to the foundations. And I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, fall for that trap. But I'm just saying, let's say Sam Harris so, came so, back so, again, would you debate him? It depends on what. Okay. And to be honest, I probably wouldn't do it myself. I'd probably get someone else to do it. Maybe like Mohammed Hijab because he's far more, he has more knowledge on usul and more knowledge on Islamic moral philosophy. Why would I do that? Mm. So, you know, hope in, so the whole point of transformation and involving and becoming more mature is that you don't throw yourself into these things all the time because you have to know your own limitations. Of course. Right? So from that point of view, you have to pick your debates and be strategic with them. Mm. Some, now, what we do, we debate for the sake of debating. Mm. And that is a really bad strategy. And it's a sign of maybe our hearts not being in the right place. Because sometimes we say no to debate. There could be contexts where we say no to debates. Yeah. Other times, we will say, yes, this person we should debate. Other times, we'll have to just assess the muscle and do sure. It's very important to do consultation with key figures in the community, people that know. So you make an assessment. Is this the right person to have a discussion with? And it might be no. With and it to, might be yes. We don't know. With regards to hijab, very briefly, do you, yes. do, do, how do you see him developing? Do you see great things in him? Yeah, absolutely. I he, think... He's uh, isn't he? He is. He is. He's, he's a bit risky, mm. but... But he admits that, and it's good that he takes risks. Knowing Quran and Arabic and stuff, well, he does he, help, not only he? Quran, he's a half he's, of Quran. How does that make you feel? In terms of like you know, you you, you engage in debates without you know reciting a lot in Arabic, having Arabic references, even though you wrote about the inimitability of the Quran. Yet, yeah, of course. I mean, look, the way see, I try and stick to what I know. Your lane. 
Yeah, that's why I don't really engage in politics much anymore because I don't know what's going on in detail, right? Mm. So, so does Islamophobia exist? Now, if it, if it was about... Does, does Islamophobia exist? We could discuss that in a minute. So, just ask you, does Islamophobia exist? It depends how you define Islamophobia. Well, we get to that? Yeah. So the issue here is when it's, when it's to do with like moral philosophy or political philosophy, because I've studied it, I could talk about it. Like yeah. if you want to talk to me about the idea of freedom mm. in Western philosophy, I could discuss that with you. Sure. But if you want to talk to me about, for example... You know the neoliberal movement in a particular country. I would not have much to say, right? So I wouldn't talk about. I'll try not to talk about those. Would things. you be able to talk about how capitalism and secular liberalism as a worldviews have perpetuated global industrial scale violence? Is that something you feel comfortable talking about? I could probably talk about it from a first principles point of view, but nothing practical. But you've done it before, though. Yeah, I know. You've but spoken about that's that, the whole point of transformation. You try and stick to what you know. Yeah. Which is a very important thing you in, in the Dawah. Well, that evidence that I used was good. That's a first principle idea. But to go even into the nuances, I won't be able to give you much information. Anyway, the point is about hijab. His, uh, ha- oh, that wasn't the question. The question was, how does it make me feel? Yeah. Well, it makes me feel quite proud of, of hijab. Do you think you've played a role in his development? I don't know. I hope so. We've had private discussions. Good. But I think, you know, I think with someone like hijab, a lot of his development will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do I mean by that? That Allah, he gives you experiences in life mm. and Allah becomes your greatest teacher. Yeah? So. And I think with someone like Hijab, with good brothers around him that could take him to account, that could question him, make him see maybe a different perspective mm. and that he continues those, having those experiences with ikhlas mm. and he's connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the right brothers, I think Allah will take him on that journey. Inshallah. Well, so look, just, and, no, and no one's perfect. You know? uh, before, before, before moving on to some of the next topics we're going to discuss. So, and he has the best laugh in the Dawah. He, he has, has the, the greatest laugh in the Dawah. Best laugh, longest reach. I was actually you know. looking at a video of him laughing, and it makes me laugh. And, <laughs> it makes and, me and, smile. And it's quite innocent and like not child, childlike, but it seems very innocent. Well, see, the thing, the thing about p- perceiving public figures is that they're not always, they're not the same, right? Of course. What they are on public, they're not usually the same in, in private. Bob, and hijab is actually a, what I would call... He's youthful. He's youthful, Bob, he's when sensitive I saw, when I saw as well, play, when in I saw some him, ways. When I saw him play FIFA at my house, I was like, this guy's like early 20s, just seems like a young brother. Yeah, I mean, he, he there's, there's, there's a great future for him, inshallah. Do you feel that there's certain topics, right? Putting aside the fact that you're trying to stay in your... Oh, language. by the way, about the Quran thing. The Quran thing wasn't about... Knowing the Arabic language, because the way I articulate the Quranic miracle is is philosophy. So, so I use inference to the best explanation. I use the epistemology of testimony, so we could articulate to a non-Arab, non-Muslim audience, mm. so it becomes coherent. So, and that's my area. Do you, so yeah. do, you do you feel yourself ever moving towards wanting to learn the Arabic and 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 and, and, and Quran? Yeah, and I, I would like to continue my Arabic. Yeah, sure. I did start learning, but I would like to continue further. Putting aside trying to stay in your lane and, and not having depth in certain topics that you want to discuss that you feel that you're necessarily qualified to discuss. Yes. But even on basic stuff, right? Like basic stuff which is beyond denying it's a reality in which we live yeah, in the sure, UK, right? About, yeah. uh, I would humbly say you don't even talk about these things. And, and you are, a, whether you like to admit it or not, Hamza, you are, whether you like it or not, bro, you are a figurehead in the Muslim community. Alhamdulillah. Look, you what? have to be strategic in what you talk about. You okay. can't talk about everything. Do you talk about everything? I don't, but I have seen you also talk about things which I don't feel you should have spoken about. But you stay okay, fair enough. But that could be a matter of opinion, right? We've just talked about these things off camera. Yeah, I know, but it could be a matter of opinion. So maybe I've specifically chosen to speak about a specific thing because my strategy or my vision mm. for the community or for the work that I do is... Is, is, is going towards a certain direction How does it make you feel And I have a strategic focus How does it make you feel that In an official government home office press release You were labelled to have had beliefs That go against fundamental British values And ultimately an extremist How does that make you feel Well I responded to it on my website That's there's, not, there's an open letter You didn't have sleepless nights No, not on this one No? No When did you have sleepless nights ever I, I have sleepless nights When sometimes I'm thinking about A philosophical topic that relates to the Dawah Wicked I have, I wouldn't call them a sleepless nights, but you know, it, it keeps you awake, right? Mm. I get agitated sometimes because I get leadership, leadership anxiety now. Because when you get older, you realize, you know, death is closer and you realize, you know, am I doing this for the sake of Allah? True. And, you know, for example, I recorded five or six podcasts with, 
my era, rerouted <laughs> our podcast. I heard the brothers told me. Show, and we haven't put it up just because of that leadership anxiety. So maybe that's excessive. Or is, it pro- is it because you didn't pronounce certain words properly and, and aren't No, do bro, it? not at all. <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> bro, you know what, yeah? You know what our first podcast? Yeah. I'm going to smash you. That's fine. Okay. We'll do what we need to do. But look, right. okay. You know so what? look, Habibi, so the point is, so those things actually don't bother me anymore. If you realise, if look, people look at my social were you media... Ever, were you ever bothered? If you look at my public work... Were you I ever bothered? don't respond to, 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 to slanders against me. Were you And ever I don't bothered? talk about... My, here's my first principles for social work, so the, the DAWA, public yeah. work. Don't defend yourself unless it's necessary for the DAWA. Don't speak about other people. And generally speaking, if you look at maybe a decade of work that I've done, hardly speak about other people or organizations That's for sure. or groups. Something wrong. And don't defend yourself. I have, look, I realized there was a point where I get agitated when I was discussing with, with atheists online and offline, trying to articulate a point. And sometimes they'll slander. Sometimes they'll make some valid points because I think a sign of a class, a sign of sincerity is that you mm. learn from people that hate you. Mm. <laughs> you, you learn sure. from your, 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 Absolutely. your, 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 from your critics. Your, from your critics. So, I, I would get a bit agitated. Then I realized one thing. It, it kind of dawned on me. It wasn't like, you know, mm. a an epiphany, but it was gradual. And it was, why am I so bothered about me? Mm. There's so much slander mm. about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Am I flinching about these things? Am I being bothered? I know you're you're ready for a few questions now, mm. yeah? But am I... Is What's my heart saying? Am I more concerned about myself? Can you stop telling me when I'm going to ask questions? Or, or, or am I more... This guy. Or am I more <laughs> concerned about Allah and his messenger? Like Al-Ghazali, uh, he basically said that... If, I don't want to misquote him. It was something along the paraphrase. lines... Paraphrase. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, something along the lines of, if you want to have peace of mind, then uh, stop defending yourself. Don't worry about yourself. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Look, a lot of the... Your narrative, your language yep. uh, of late has been shaped around the concept of love, mercy and compassion. Yep. Yeah. Compassion, uh, compassionately articulating the message of Islam. And right? intelligently. Yeah. Intelligently, and yeah. And it seems to solely and exclusively be around that. Why is that? Because I follow the classical opinion, orthodox classical opinion. Mm. Classical opinion yeah. that say, say again, classical Classical okay, opinion okay. That um, The default position When you're articulating and sharing Islam mm. Is one of forbearance yeah. Hilm yeah. Compassion Rahma And uh, And stuff like that And I agree with you Yeah But we also know I mean as an organisation as yourself To have now Kind of made it synonymous And maybe rightly so Actually not definitely rightly so To have This is the prophetic model Good Right Good But you seem to negate Or you seem to At least disproportionately Put aside The fact that the Anbiya alayhi salam Were harsh Came with Bashira And warnings Yeah absolutely Came Were harsh at times Were very compassionate at times and it was proportionate. Absolutely. So how come is it that you've centered the, the dawah entirely around those aspects? Well, I think that's a bit un- unfair. That's Have you un- Christianized Islamic dawah, bro? No, oh, absolutely no. What's the matter with you? No, you've like made it like very... It's all love and mercy. No, no, it's not true because we're also <laughs> positively assertive. For example, look... Give me an example. Of, it, it, give me an example when you were positively assertive. Well, for example, we mentioned Hellfire. And we remind people that, <laughs> you know, if you... Actively, actively deny the truth You're eligible for eternal damnation Where did, okay. and, and destruction Okay when, when did you say that? It's in our literature It's in, our, it's in my talks For okay. example Okay that's good I like For I, example I, A talk I did recently That's online Which is called Seven reasons why Allah Is worthy of worship Oh that was uh, a fantastic essay By the it, way it, Well I did, gave a talk in it yeah, as well Yeah I mentioned, I mentioned that. That was fantastic. Yeah absolutely See the point is You look, even said to me once let, let, That, that let, punishment let, is even A form of compassion isn't it? Punishment is a form of compassion, absolutely. Explain that to our viewers. Like, for example, say in legal theory, right? Yeah. Say, for example, there was France wanted to, had, had a treaty with the UK. Yeah. Okay? And then they broke the treaty. And the implications of breaking that treaty was that they now want to annihilate everyone in the UK, or mm. most people in the UK. Mm. Now, they broke it once. And you, you didn't do anything. And then you did another treaty with them. Say you forgave them. And then you did another treaty... And then they broke it again. 
Now, if you allow them to continue, then that's basically doing a huge disservice to your community and people that you're responsible you take over. Li- you're taking liberties. You're it's taking not just liberties up. because yeah. you're basically now, and di- you're putting your community in danger. Yeah. Right. Your citizens in danger. So what would be compassionate is to have a mechanism in place to prevent from such stuff happening and to have suitably harsh punish- punishments if there's a breaking of that particular treaty because because if they break that treaty and they enact on their intentions, which is they want to annihilate you, mm. that basically will... Um, and, and you don't do anything about it, that's not compassionate at all. Sometimes you have to have a suitably harsh uh, mechanism to prevent that from happening. Do you accept that? And we know this even even okay. as parents, okay. yeah? Okay, like, you know, you can't be... You, you, permissive parenting is, is, is not a good way of mm. bringing up your children, just letting them do whatever they want. The best form of parenting is not authoritarian, which is very disciplinarian and it's like the army, yeah? But it's authoritative parenting. Where you have the love and law. So within the law, it's all love and mercy. Mm. You're outside of the law, then we have boundaries, Mm. right? And, you know, people who don't have boundaries in in, in all due respect, those type of people are are deluded by the egos and the desires. And that's why, you know, you have some of these very excessive neoliberal types, yeah? yeah? They're like... Do whatever you want. want. Now that is the most... Change your agenda. Well, for me, from a metaphysical, spiritual perspective, bro, really, they're chasing an absolute freedom that will never exist in the world. And in reality, their chase for absolute freedom is really their desire for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he is absolutely free. He is al-ghani. He is the independent. He is the free. Um, So, yeah, sometimes being suitably harsh is... In the grand cosmic scheme of things, far more compassionate and the right thing to do. So you know, just and that's not a problem. I don't see how that's a problem. No, no, I'm just saying that you know, with with a lot of the public literature of IERAs and some of the polls and articles they've written, there is a massive focus yeah. on love, mercy, and compassion, which I'm saying to you isn't a problem. Look, here's like, he, 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 a narrative. I'm, so I'm saying for to be pro- do do you think that you're proportionately balanced between that aspect of the prophetic dawa? And that of enjoining good, forbidding evil. Well, the uh, greatest ac- ac- accounting. Yeah, sure. I know. I know. The what greatest, you say, the greatest uh, good you can enjoin is inviting people to Allah. Is is the enjoining of tawheed, yes. affirming the oneness of Allah and so, the fact that He's worthy of worship. Would you? The, and the greatest evil, bro. The greatest evil in our tradition, right? Mm. And every, if, you, if we don't know this, then we're, we don't know anything about shirk. Islam. It's shirk. It's so. associating partners with Allah. It's associating partners with Allah. So Tao is one of the is one of the greatest expressions of commanding the good and forbidding the evil. But a manifestation of that great responsibility is also because because the, the prophets didn't just come down for that. They came down ultimately the message of Tawheed yes. and Islamic monotheism. Yep. But an emanation, an inevitable outcome and manifestation of that was to address the social ills of their time, Hamza. Sometimes it wasn't prioritized, sometimes it was. Yeah, it depends what prophet you're talking about. Okay, so give me an example. Uh, let's 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 do this then. Uh, give me an example of a prophet who came down with the message of Islamic monotheism, believing in Allah, associating no partners with him. But never address the social ills of their time. No, I didn't say they didn't do that. I said sometimes it was it, th- there was priorities. That right? was that's always yeah. the priority. I, I guess, absolutely, that's right, yeah, but I'm so saying, I agree. But, but I'm saying, so all we're a, doing is uh, we're strategically focusing on a particular priority, which is I don't see how that's a problem. No, I'm saying that when it doesn't branch out to the other things which come with inviting people to Islam and Islamic monotheism. What do so you do? what do you suggest we do? I'm not saying that you guys start cleaning streets and, and stuff like that. I'm just saying perhaps ponder on and reflect and consider perhaps like for example like providing we, commentary on, on some social socio political issues which are affecting the community. Yeah. If it falls within your charitable remit. Yeah, of course. And your anti extremism policy. Yeah, but that's what we do then. Charity commission. <laughs> so but, but that's exactly what we do. Sometimes we do make commentary and we link it back to Tawheed. Mm. Um, and sometimes we decide not to based on strategic reasons and because we think there are certain priorities that we have to focus on. Can I ask you a question? And how's that a problem? That's Can I ask you a question? Yeah. It's really Look, I, I want to give you the strategy based on the Quran. So right. in the 20th chapter, yeah. around verse 44, Allah speaks to Musa alayhi salam. Okay. And Musa alayhi salam is going to Fir'aun. Fir'aun, one of the most evil creatures on the planet because he thought he was God, right? So. Musa alayhi salam is told by Allah to speak to Fir'aun. Say, Layyinan, yeah? Layyinan. With, with, with lean, right? So that's the, the, the root here, the kind of, it means like softly, softly and softly. kindly, lenient, yeah. yeah? With some kind of leniency and mercy. What happened after he spoke exactly. to Exactly. So then after, the, so from verse 44, verse 48, in the middle, there's a bit of a dialogue or a narrative going on. Yeah. And then after Musa alayhi salam says, basically you're going to hell. You're going to hell. Exactly. exactly. So yeah. it teaches us the default position 
is softness, mercy. Imam al-Qurtubi, Qurtubi, one of the classical commentators, what did he say about this? He said, if Moses, Musa alayhi salam, had to speak to Pharaoh in this way, imagine how we must speak to other people. Just like what one scholar said. To begin with, like, have you like one scholar said, but I'm going to address that. The baseline default to begin with. I'm going to address yes. this. So one scholar said, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, calm down. You're not a Moses and he's not a Pharaoh, <laughs> right? Fair so enough. yes. So initially, when you're giving da'wah, when you're sharing Islam, you do it compassionately and intelligently. Now, changing from that strategy requires an understanding of the moral variables and the context. And you have to apply the classical conception of maslaha. Mm. For example, Al-Ghazali, he had a three-pronged approach to maslaha. He said it had to be necessary. The thing that you do... It was necessary yep, to do. Yep. He also said that the thing that you had to do had to be comprehensive. So it was utility because the word maslaha shares the same root as the word utility in Arabic, I believe. So it had to be a benefit for the collective, not just the individual. The right? collective body yeah. of, 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 of the ummah, so, yes. of the Muslims. And it had to be definite that you knew that doing this necessary action would highly likely lead to X, Y, and Z. And that's why when he, when he dealt with the moral dilemma of throwing a person off a boat, he said, you can't do this mm. because it's not for the, the collective, right? So, but he did say in other contexts that certain actions were necessary and that if you did them, it would lead to a greater good and it would benefit Everybody. But we mentioned earlier on in the podcast, some maslaha is one of those principles that has been unduly used. But the to reason justify being because maslaha things. is you could do there's the three there's three reasons for maslaha really. No, but, 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 but when you could accept it. But so. those but those three conditions have to be. Well, it can't be one of three. Well, it depends if you follow Al Ghazali's view on this. Mm. But modern scholars actually they probably follow two out of the, out of the three. Okay. But that's a different discussion, of right? But if the maslaha is not in line with the text, like it contradicts the text. You can't take the maslaha. Of course. But people do that. That's the problem, yeah? And by the way, maslaha and maqasid and mm. the high objectives of the sharia or the objectives of the sharia, yep. uh, th th there's a kind of like gray, gray area. area. There's overlaps, a bit of overlap. Overlaps, yeah. Overlaps, yep. so, but in terms of maslaha, if it contradicts the text... Straight away, it's a no-no. It's a no-no. If it's in line with the text, no problem. Mm. If the text doesn't say anything about it, then you could still do it. So, 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 so but so, some people, what okay. they do, kind of these neo modernist types, yep. they're like, well, this is my interpretation of good, and my interpretation of good so goes okay, against sorry. the Quran and Sunnah. And I'm going to crack on and do it. Yeah, well, basically, really, that's just a humanism. So, <laughs> so, but, but let me just ask you this. And that's a disservice to Islam, that's really. Let me, let me, and our moral philosophy. Can I ask you something? Do you want some Obviously, it's more nuanced than that, but these are, these are general principles. Don't oh, give some, I'm just no, no, that's fine. No, I don't do sweet stuff. I try okay. not to do sweet okay, stuff. Buddy. Although I had a milkshake yesterday, but still. Uh, and um, can I ask you something? Yeah. Do you get the point so far? No, I got the point. Good. Alhamdulillah. Don't talk to me like a So thing. it's a nuanced strategy. Oh, but it's okay for you to be rude to me for yeah. the past. No, no. God, God knows Look, how long. Can I ask you why you've yeah. made public statements rightfully condemning um, acts of criminality and terrorism committed against non-Muslims in non-Muslim countries. Yeah. But generally, there has been a kind of pin-drop silence with, against Muslims. Well, as an organization or as an individual? Both. Well, because we felt that it was in line with our Dao strategy. Because we're not condemning or saying this is bad because we're apologetic. Absolutely not. No, no, I didn't ask that, Habibi. No, no, I, I'm just, I'm I, just I just asked you... That there seems there because is. because non-Muslims, unfortunately, in this day and age, they yeah. associate these actions with the Islamic tradition, and because we're involved in the Dawah, we're basically saying to pe people that it's not in line with the Islamic moral worldview, mm. and this is the reason why. And I don't think there's a problem with that. Okay, but then there's literally nothing about. No, that's not true. We've mentioned stuff like we mentioned what happened in Australia, in New Zealand. Okay. We actually sent a team there. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking about the Muslim world, the Muslim majority world, where 500,000 have died in Syria, 100,000 have been forcibly dispelled from Myanmar by Buddhists, um, Muslims being killed in India for merely having beef. On an individual, Kashmir like Palestine. I was talking about what's no, happening in China no, no, all a I'm few saying, days ago. I, I mean, yeah. But, but what, as an organization, it's not a remit. Okay, I'm, okay fine. Let's put, let's put Aira. No, no, well, bro, Aira did issue a comment on Christchurch. Yes. And Paris. But that's our remit, isn't Paris. it? Okay, because fine. Because it's related to the Dawa. Okay. How prophetic do you think that is? Prophetic? Yeah. Well, we don't claim to be an embodiment of the whole prophetic model. We're a Tao organization. No, you have used that in your paraphernalia and 
No, it's the the prophetic mission is fundamentally calling people to the worship of Allah. Okay, fine. Do you think as part of the prophetic mission is to disproportionately condemn, rightfully condemn, I must add. Yeah, of course. Rightfully yeah. condemn the acts of criminality and mindless violence committed by those who identify as Muslims. But then, bro, pin drop silence and other issues relating to the ummah. Yes. Whether I hear it or you, why do you, why? Well, me, no, I talk about it. It's, you could see it throughout maybe some lectures. Oh, or 2013. No, 12, recently. 11, I, I okay. think I was talking about China recently. Okay. How long, how long did it take you to talk about China? I'm just asking. How like, long? Yeah, like. I don't know. What do you mean by how long? Like in terms of my reaction or? Or did you, because what's happening in Xinjiang is now a thing that everyone knows about it. So you, did you think you kind of just jumped on the bandwagon? No, but i got to be honest, this is not my realm, bro. I don't really deal with politics anymore. So you don't know that half a million have died in Syria? I didn't know half a million died in Syria. I know, I, I know people are butchered in Habibi, Syria. Habibi, what am I merely asking you? And just give me a straight answer, bruv. Sure. But you know what? You know, look, I agree. The thing is, is that do you not have. The door swings both ways. When's the last time you talked about dawah or talked about the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that we would like you to do? Remember, I, it's, it's not just one way. The door okay. swings both ways. Okay, so fine. there are some organizations, like for example, there's an organization Bet that. Bedfordians and Lutonians know that when I get the opportunity, I am in, in our local dawah. When you get the opportunity. So the point is, yeah, it's not mind. your strategic focus. Okay. So I'm not, you an, have to, I'm not an organization. I'm just a little saying. Yeah, individual. but you're missing the point. No, no, I'm not. You're also that. five pillars, right? Uh, we're a news website. Yeah, agreed. So you're not a Muslim news website? We're a Muslim news website. Yeah, good. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe you should talk about what Islam talks about, which is affirming the oneness of Allah and that he deserves worship. But you see, I'm not being harsh on you. I'm trying to say to you, the door <laughs> Swings both ways, Habibi. Yeah, we have made a decision. <laughs> nice, that you I, got that yes, one. Yeah, good. that's rude, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, Habibi, what you need to do, what you need to understand is, this doesn't mean we don't have sentiments like you have these sentiments. Uh, you know what's happening in China. My advice about the whole China issue is, and I was going to actually speak to you about this or speak to other people about this, which was, we need to get Muslims or non-Muslims to go outside the Chinese em embassy and use any legal means necessary to create as much noise as we can. Because what's happening is like Nazi Germany, yeah. So definitely, that's my point. So th that was an idea that I was going to bring to the elders and people who are in this field. But it's not my particular field. Mm. We have a vision, a world reconnected to God, a world reconnected to Allah, and we have a strategic focus. We can't do everything. Yeah. So you do have. So, so you have. You do have Rida for the Ummah, yeah. I'm just asking. <laughs> <You're so funny>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to slap you up after this podcast. <laughs> Of course, bro. Of course, that's good. Absolutely, that's good. bro. You know, some of these things really, you know, they upset you. And you know what? I'm going to be honest as well. Don't from a psychological crying. point of view, I'm going to cry. Don't start crying. From a, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> from a psychological point of view, yeah. sometimes I also try to ignore it because it's painful, bro. You it know, is, when I can't is. do anything it myself, Christ. I just have to give it to the God basket. You know, put things in, 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 in the God basket, mm. meaning Allah will deal with it because it's so painful. You know, Christ right? took me a long while to get over. I know it's crazy because we know that wars are happening and taking place in Wallahi Christchurch took me ages to get over it. I was really down and under, bruv. Really? Yeah, because I think the manner in which Christchurch happened, it was... Because we know that Muslims are being killed and slaughtered in many parts of the world, but Christchurch, the way it was live-streamed, and it, was, it, was, it took me a while to get over that, bruv. It was hard. Yeah. Like kids and stuff. Yeah, just, and and, and, and live-streamed. Anyway, may Allah make it easy for everybody I mean, yeah, and I mean, yeah, grant us success. So, look, so as you know, we have a specific strategic focus. Uh, so, we have a vision, a world reconnected to Allah, to God, and we have a strategic focus. And the strategic focus is very specific because we realize if you focus, you get successful. And alhamdulillah, I think for the past two and a half years, we've, we've achieved a hell of a lot. Is that why you dropped Don't Hate Debate? Wait, man, just wait. So is it? Let's discuss this. Just say, you can't throw it all at me. Let me just make a point here, right? But you're following so your notice script. No, the strategic, take it. The strategic focus, Habibi, is that we develop, empower, and support Muslims to share Islam all around the world. Which you're doing a fantastic and job. And the way we're doing that is now we're hiring outreach specialists all around the world. We have around 41 or 42 outreach specialists spanning around 22 or 23 countries around that number, and we've impacted directly 43 countries and through our materials around 100 countries we're across six continents and we're growing and growing alhamdulillah because we focus on our strategic focus and these du'at these people are taught to be holistic muslims to command the good forbid the evil to also you know call people with compassion and with reason people back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create awakenings within people mm. because we believe every single human being bro has a has good in them has a fitra and in that fitra that innate disposition is that allah is a reality and he's worthy of extensive praise but it gets clouded bro mm. because of the system yes because of teaching because of parenting because of all of these things and it's our job to humbly 
try and uncloud people's innate disposition to awaken the truth within. That's what we're about. And that's why we can't talk about everything. So you appreciate that I Just guess, like you don't talk about everything Just like you don't focus about everything uh, bro, we're, a, we're a Muslim news website That covers Muslim current affairs Pe- and news Name stories. me five organisations Do they talk about the things that we talk about? No, no, but, but just, I'm trying to say that your criticism Was a very unfair criticism No, I'm saying that an organization, you swing the door no, the no, other no, way, no, no, bro No, 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 let's, let, let's, put, let's put swinging aside Yeah <laughs> I'm just saying that when you talk about an organisation <laughs> That claims to be upon the prophetic mission Right? Yes. Uh, yeah, but we define what specifically that means in our context. And I'm saying to you that from studying the lives of the prophets, when they were upon this mission, an emanation of that creed and that belief agree. was that they enjoined good and forbidding. Totally and totally agree. So you're basically saying that there are other organizations but that are respectively. You, but you need to understand that life now has become far more complex to the point where some people are fulfilling some of those other functions. And the reason AIR was created around 10 years ago was because there wasn't a kind of a collective global organization, collective organization that came together to actually call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the right way. We filled a gap. Why would we want to basically reinvent the wheel and do things that other organizations are doing? Let me give you an example. You felt that no one else was doing it at the time? Well, not to that level. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, I wasn't the founder. So that was basically the, that was the kind of justification yeah, of for course. the founders. Now, listen to this. That made it a key priority, right? Now, bro, fundraising for du'at is easy. Ten years ago, when you said give money for a da'i, for, 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 for someone who's calling to Allah, people would have laughed at you. They would have said, no, what are you talking about, right? We've changed the narrative now because people know this is a focus, right? Mm. Anyway, the, and it's a key focus we must have. And listen to this. Um, du'at, funding, da'wah, No, I, I was going to talk about other organizations. I forgot now. You made me forget. That's fine. But anyway, the point is, behind the scenes, we help other organizations in the best way that we can to command the good and forbid the evil, right? <laughs> in the most ethical way possible. And you know this as well. <coughs> don't you feel a bit small now talking to me as if we don't do anything, right? Prophet. The point is, Habibi, <laughs> ah, now you're laughing, yeah? So the point is, I'm not going to expose you, so it's fine. But the point is, Habibi, the thing I, I want you to realize, ah, yes, you're sweating, yeah? Well, you're the like thing is, it's good that you're doing this now because these are valid... Nah, people perce- have these questions Yeah, they're good, Hamza the valid perceptions. Right? But now they know, but now they will know that exactly. Hamza, the organization as well... Remit, helps, scope, our, yeah, objective, yeah, aims. Our, remit, our scope, objective, and we have a new ethical strategic position. And also, we also help Thanks. other organizations behind the scene to elevate the sector, to make it more robust. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, anyway, okay. look, you know... Atheism aside, and even talking about certain philosoph- philosoph- philosophies, putting all that aside, when you look at the actual manifestation of these ideologies and these philosophies within the Muslim community, yes. like for example, you know, what does the Muslim community do? What does a Muslim family do when they've got someone in their household who has left Islam? Like, 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 fine, we can talk about atheism and the mirage of atheism and, and, and divine reality and all that stuff. Valid Absolutely valid and very much needed work. The manifestation of the ills of these things in our community. Yeah. How do we deal with it? Well, look, there's a few reasons I believe why people leave Islam. And this is from a practical perspective. I'm not talking about the kind of metaphysical spirituality. Because mm. fundamentally, the basis of all kufr, mm. denying the truth, is based on kibr and hawa. Sah. It's based on arrogance and, and desires. If you study the Quran, this that's is, the kind of thing that you yeah, can be it, Allah mentions that quite yes, often. But from a practical point of view, and this is also in line with our tradition, I believe, there's a key reasons why people maybe doubt or leave Islam. Mommy, daddy issues? Well, number one, I call them social issues. And, and it's very important. I think we should discuss these boys. I think it'd be very imp- powerful for the listener. Okay. Yeah? Or even someone yes. viewing this. The first one is social. And that means a lot of things. Parents. So there's mm. a psychodynamic element. The Muslim community. And something called informational social influence or normative social influence. People have a need to belong mm. and have a need to feel certain. That develops the social norm. And this is known in social psychology. So in terms of the social problems, we need to unravel this. So f- number one, bro. We're not the best community in the world. Say in Britain, for example. And that, that there's lots of reasons for that. Social economic, ideological, some things are structural, yeah. some things are definitely our fault, yeah, some, some things, things are impossible control, yeah, yeah. whatever okay, the case may be. Enough, yeah. But we've got work to do, yeah? We have lots of work to do, right? We're going through what I call post-colonial trauma, yeah? 
because there's lots of work to do, right? So a lot of our children being brought up in this environment may be a dark interpretation of Islam that's not even in line with our tradition because they didn't know. They came as economic migrants. They probably weren't very educated. They didn't even know much about Islam. They did their best, right? Yeah. But I mean, in that environment, maybe they brought up their child. They never had love at home. They never had any mercy at home. It was all about do, do, do. Doesn't explain the why. People are praying. They don't know why. People are supposed to believe in this like metaphysical entity, God, and I don't know why. All of these kind of things, right? They weren't, provide re- they, they weren't provided reasons. There was maybe uh, negative parenting. So that's one of the reasons. And that's why, bro, we need to become intellectually spiritually mature. Because when I do meet some of these people, I don't even address the intellectual questions. Because from experience, I know... There's other issues. Oh, definitely, bro. Definitely. Okay, fine. So, so, so let, let's, let's... So, let's... so there's the, commu- the parenting commu- community aspect, the psychodynamic issues. The other one is, uh, as I said, the social malaise. We need to, inshallah, help our community just elevate the moral bar again, right? Where it should be. The other thing is, people need to belong, bro. It's a need. We're not functional. We're not computerized functional robots. You can't type in an algorithm and expect some kind of results. Human beings, as Allah created them, sophisticated has a ruh, has a nafs, has a qalb, has a fitrah, has an aql. And the mm. aql is a function of the heart in, mm. in Islam. So it's all of these things and that they, there's a dynamic interplay going on. You can't just give them an argument and expect something. We'll, you know, we have a need to belong. We have a need to feel certain. And from a social point of view... If I don't belong to my immediate group, the Muslim community, because maybe they don't like the way I look yeah. or the way I speak or the way I dress now, then what am I going to do? I'm going to try and satisfy that need to belong to the dominant group. So. And that's why people, they okay. literally, we need to be a little bit more loving in our okay, community. Okay, fine. So. And the other, the other point is certainty. If you're uncertain about something, you're going to leave it. And your immediate group doesn't give you that certainty. If you go to Imam and he says, oh, just believe, shush, yeah, yeah. right? And you're not providing intellectual, moral, yeah, yeah, yeah. And spiritual answers, then they're going to go to the dominant group. Fine. So, so my point again, is, we're reaping what we sow. So let's put social. that aside. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. So that's but, the social, but there's many other I mean, reasons. The, yeah. I mean, those, okay, but what I'm saying now is, Talk to me about practicals Yeah, so this yeah. is the practice So once we know what the problems are but What the causes are We could go to the solutions But would you not argue then That if excessive time I'm, I'm just playing advocate here Yeah, yeah? of course If, if, if you're doing that very well yeah, For the past but, God knows how long uh, anyway, But if, I, if we have someone within the community Or a number of individuals within the community That have publicly and proudly left Islam yes. Right? Would you say that to invest too much love, mercy, and compassion? Hear me out. Yes, hear me out. Agreed. Agreed. I that, that, agree with you. That, 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 that you're, essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of validating and perpetuating. Yeah, that, you know what? Agreed. Even though you've done it, we still love you. Absolutely. Sometimes agree. isolation There's works. There's a difference between individuals yeah. and, and a people movement. and a movement and even symbols of that movement or, or key leaders in that movement, and they have gratuitous insults and mockery. And they almost uh, they they made careers at, out of it, bro. Well, basically, they 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 have a kind of moral intellectual war against Islam. Of course, yeah. Those people need to be dealt with fundamentally differently. Okay, so well, we're talking about the everyday your, people. Your, your your original question, which was family at so, home. Okay, fair enough. So when it comes to this, we have to know what the causes are. Do you are. think Do you think there should be a level of harshness from the family at some point? It, like it, enough, as enough. again, as again, when we talk, when we understand the concept of maslaha, which is a very profound concept, we apply in that context. Mm. You will need to know that context. Unfortunately, my initial response would be no harshness. I'll tell you why. Because unfortunately, just from my limited experiences, it was because of harshness that they basically left in the first place, yeah? Or excessive love. I've never seen that. No, because you took a very, just literally 10 minutes. True, spoke it could about, be. Permissive par- parenting, yeah. yeah. It could be. But I haven't seen that though. The Unfortunately, in kind of the Asian subcontinent Muslim community, you it's have what harshness. you call author- authoritarian parents. Yeah, which is like... So you're saying that you've seen more cases of... People leaving his son because of those kind of parenting, that Bro, kind of parenting. Someone came up to me. Yeah? He said, "Oh, I saw your debate with Krauss is very good, but I'm still an atheist. He's he, he's an apostate." Yeah. I just said to him, "How's your parents?" Yeah. I think he spent about ten minutes talking to me about how dark his 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 yeah. his, 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 his him growing up was. Right now, I don't want to look like oh Hamza's self hating now against the Muslim community. No. We have to be honest and transparent to know the problem. So that's the social pro- social cause. How do you solve that? We need to just come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as best as possible. We need to be parents in line with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which I believe was an author- authoritarian style of parenting. If you look at the narratives when you know he was dealing with his children, even when he was dealing with Anas ibn Malik and all of these things, it was lots of love, lots of rahmah, but there was a... Authoritative. Authoritative, yeah, not yeah, authoritarian. Yeah. Authoritarian is very disciplinary. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, the yeah. army, yeah? yeah? Authoritative, which is you're an authority figure, but there's a shura, there's... Uh, you, you're, you're explaining the reasons why you're doing things. You're, mm. 
you're, you're rationalizing with the child to, to their level, you're having empathy, you're having lots of love and mercy, but you have your boundaries. And when they're crossed, then you basically deal with it appropriately, right? So and that's the kind of parenting that we need. And that's missing in our, in our culture, unfortunately. Give me, give but me it's part of our tradition. So that's one solution. The other solution is also to empower the individual who has left Islam or has lots of doubts because of that, to teach them, hey, you need to empower yourself too. The past doesn't equal the future, right? To empower them to say that you also have the power to take back control of the, 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 the dynamic in the relationship you have with your family. Like, mm. you know, one person came up to me and basically said, there's no love at home. I said, okay, when was the last time you said to your parents you loved them? Or gave them a hug. Exactly. You need to enroll people in your behavior. So it's not just about blaming mm. the parents or the society. It's also saying, hey, you're an individual. You need to be empowered in some way. You can be that vehicle of change as That the past doesn't equal the future, mm. right? That we have a drama and a reality. And our drama is based on our limited experiences, ideas, and whatever the case may be. And we impose it on what is. Sometimes we make those things the same and they're not the same. So trying to empower them existentially and, and philosophically from that point of view. So all that needs to be done. We need to come back to Islam. And even, our, even the way we teach our children. So this goes to the next cause, which is intellectual mm. reasons for people leaving Islam. Generally speaking, it's based on two things maybe. Evil. They don't know why Islam is true or, or why Allah is worthy of worship. And the other reason is science and progress, right? Easy things to deal with, but we don't deal with it at home. That's the problem. How many parents teach their children? And I want you to go out, bro, in the community and discuss this. How many parents teach their children, this is why Allah is worthy of worship. This is why He's worthy to be known. This is why He's worthy to be loved. This is why He's worthy to be obeyed. And you must be humble before Him. And this is why you must direct all internal and external acts of worship to Allah alone. But Hamza, you know that most parents, especially from the Indian subcontinent, but I would obviously extend this to the to non-Asians as well. Sure, sure. They simply don't, they're not equipped with those arguments. But bro. that's the solution. They therefore. outsource it to the masjid. But that's the solution. And they don't get in the masjid. <laughs> but that's why I'm very happy that recently we gave this uh, type of seminar lecture at a masjid mm. and they want to basically create create extensive workshops for parents. So they feel that this is actually one of the key solutions to actually solve the problems that we're facing. So we need to re-educate uh, 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 and prioritize the education, right? Because sometimes our Islam is, this is how you pray, this is how you fast, you're a Muslim. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's something a little bit before that you have to first discuss, which is, why, why is you it believe, that you're why Muslim? Do you worship? And I'm not saying that you have to intellectualize and philosophize everything mm. because it's part of your fitrah anyway. But even a cursory, even a cursory understanding of you these know, things why, make you know, a massive why, change. Why does Allah deserve gratitude? Because the whole Quran focuses on that issue. Mm. Why Allah is worthy of ob obedience, love, to be known, and to direct all ac acts of worship to Him alone. So that's one thing we need to do. And also we need to empower our community. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, our classical tradition. We already have the answers, bro. And I already wrote this in my book. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. Is to contemporize our classical tradition. We know how to deal with scientism. We know how to deal with philosophical naturalism, right, which is the kind of philosophical worldview that there is no supernatural, no divine. Mm. Everything can be explained by physical processes. We have these answers. It should be part of our common discourse, our common narratives in our communities. And, and, and we need to train our imams, train our leaders, train our communities and our parents to basically filter down that information in a way that's understandable, in a way that's, um, that, that, that could be internalized. And people are now, you know, they have this kind of moral intellectual leadership that they could go into society and say, well, actually, yeah, you're right, science is great, but it's based on induction. There could be another observation that contradicts our previous conclusions. It's dynamic. It's not absolute, right? So you're not basically making a false um, equation that, you know, divine knowledge is the same as human mm. scientific knowledge. Because one comes from the divine, he has the picture, we just have the pixel, pixel. yeah. And, 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 and the other one is just a pixelated understanding of reality. And if someone, someone studies the philosophy of science, they'll know that. So the point is, I know this is very crude, but these are general principles. The point is, we need to revive that in, in our discussions in, as a community. So, so that deals with the intellectual cause okay, of so, so And there's so, more, by the way. Okay, so, so, so that's social, intellectual, there's also spiritual, there's psychological, which I want to discuss okay, we, so, very quickly. So, so, just, so just, I need to clarify something. Absolutely. So those who are not kind of openly, actively against Islam and Muslims as part of a movement, they don't, you, you wouldn't advise harshness and isolation and then ostracization Unless against after them. after speaking to them and giving them a lot of time, and again, it's all about the muscle, how you need to know the moral contextual variables. Now, if they come very arrogant, then just like what I did 
to someone in this building. Mm. Someone came and I had a, a discussion with him and he contradicted himself. And by the way, as a general rule, kufr always contradicts itself. Of course. You know, denying, belief, so, denying the truth yeah, contradicts yeah. itself. And when he used contradictory kind of philosophies you to make his point, I was like, you're an arrogant. And he was shocked. So you're just arrogant. You've just got nothing to do with intellectual stuff. So arrogance aside, yeah. These those who have left the folds and those who are not even leaving the folds, some those who are engaged in same sex relationships, which nearly always also results in atheism as well, or leaving the folds of Islam, those who aren't kind of open, openly, insincerely against Islam and Muslims, they require time and patience, yeah? Yeah, and, and mercy, yeah. Mercy, love and compassion. Until they start taking a biscuit out of these things, yeah? Yeah, obviously we have our moral boundaries, of course. But go on quickly, you tell me about the spiritual aspect So, as well. So the other one is a spiritual aspect, which we don't know. Like, for example, we're, we're told do's and don'ts, right? Mm. So if we were taught, for example... But the example, do's and don'ts are important, bro. Absolutely. If you don't have do's and don'ts, then you don't have Islam. <laughs> exactly. So but you need to know why you do the do's and don'ts, okay. right? Then you know you don't have holistic Islam, proper Islam, right? So if a kid doesn't know why Allah is worthy of worship, and a kid, for example, in his salah, doesn't know how, what the fatah means, doesn't know what the kind of uh, supplications... That's most Muslims. But that's part of our problem. I'll give you an example, bro. Someone came up to you, quantum physicist, the demasters, yeah. after one of my lectures, Pakistani guy, right? Yeah. So I'm an atheist kind of yeah. thing. He said, your argument, Hamza, doesn't make sense, right? Where was he? He was in England, yeah. yeah. He said, it doesn't make sense, Hamza, because causality doesn't make sense outside of the universe. Now, I could have went into the big debate of, you know, you've got an empirical presupposition. You're saying that causality is derived from experience, but mm. it's actually the other way around. I could have given him a Kantian argument. Forget that. We need to be more intellectual, spiritually mature. He already has the truth within him. We have to uncloud his fitra. So from my experience, I said to him, what do you mean by causality, bro? Because in Western philosophy, bro, they haven't ironed out the issue. Mm. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he didn't really know. And I okay. said, isn't it very interesting you're using a key word in a sentence to deny but God? You, and you don't know, don't know you don't know what I'm going on this issue. <laughs> and I said, come sit down. I was very friendly with him. And you know what he said to me? From what I remember, he said, I didn't connect with Allah. I didn't pray properly. I didn't know how to pray. And I, didn't, I didn't have that connection. His issue was an issue of connection, spirituality, bro. Do you see my point? Now, some of us, because we're in the debating scene, or maybe we don't, we we, we haven't progressed or transformed. Want well, to intellectually clot him and leave yeah, it? Yeah, but then he'd have another question, or basically he'll put his barriers up. So we need to be uh, a little bit more intellectual, spiritually mature, well, intre- and- to find out what would uncloud his innate disposition, as I previously mentioned. Anyway, so that's one thing we need to teach our children about these things. And also, we need to prepare our children. You know, you need to do your athkar and your dhikr in the morning and the evening, especially living in the West, yeah? These, this is your protection. This is your connection with Allah. And so that's the first spiritual. The other one is psychological. What does this mean? The psychological one means that it's about ego, kibr, and how our desires. Which are intrinsically linked with disbelief and shit. Yeah, but on those, those ones require a little bit of positive assertiveness. Yeah, You can't be nice too much. Because if someone's really arrogant, egotistical, bro, then you need to like really... Chuck it back. Well, you need to create awakenings with them mm. and say, hold on a second, who the hell are you? Mm. Who the hell are you? You think you're going to live forever? You think you were a catapult from your mother's room with a briefcase and a tie? You think you're individual, this crazy individualism, which is the premise of uh, neoliberalism, mm. that you're the abstract entity divorced from any social atta- obligations and attachments, right? W- w- what's wrong with you? You're individual, not individual. The very reason you're here, the reason, reason we're here, bro, is as a result, we're connected to a system, to other people, to the fact that people have to wake up in the morning and all of these things. If we're dependent fundamentally on nearly an infinite number of variables, of course. and I say to them, and all of those things are dependent on Allah. So who do you think you are? You know, as Allah says, there was a time that you weren't even mentioned, right? You're a nutfa tin min mani, and you're a nutfa, you're a despised fluid, right? Who do you think you are? And you put this pout on Instagram and social media. You should put that fluid on your Instagram, see, but, see how many likes you get, right? But you pout as well. I've seen you do it. You do this thing with your lips. Do I? It's probably out of anxiety. Okay. It's not probably... Have you noticed you do that? You do this thing where you bite your lips and you look up. Yeah, it's just the way I think maybe. I, th- yeah. I think it's pretty cute. Thank you, bro. Do I get kids after? No. <laughs> so anyway, the point I'm trying to say, Habibi, is um, those type of people may require a different, different conversation. Mm. Yeah. And look, even with me, me being a Muslim, bro, there were times where brothers had to say to me, Hamza, you're arrogant. Honestly, they had to create awakenings within me And I'm like, subhanAllah, you know what, that's all right And other times, bro, Allah gave me those humiliating moments And I remember one sheikh said to me He said, on the day of judgment You would want a thousand of those moments to have happened Because Allah is taking you through through tarbiyah Look at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, bro We think the story of Yusuf alayhi salam 
is just about Yusuf. It's not. It's also about his brothers. Yes. His brothers started with the kind of prideful ten group. They were almost wanted to kill Yusuf alayhi salam. But what does Allah do to them? They get humiliated. Got humbled. Had they to get back humbled. To him. Had to get back to they, him. There was a famine. Yeah. They had to beg almost. They Reverend they basically yeah. had to be split into different uh, parts of the city. They were accused of stealing. Yeah. And then after the ego was diminished, Allah gave them tarbiyah. So, Allah. And then they asked for forgiveness, and Allah forgave them for my belief. And Yusuf Ali forgave, forgave them. forgave them as well. And that's why some. And that's why you know mm-hmm. when I read that story, I don't see myself as you. Of course, mm-hmm. I see myself as the brothers. Mm-hmm. Because when you grow in the Tao and you transform, you're like as I said in the, in the beginning, some of my Tao was about ego. Unfortunately, it happens, and you go struggle with yourself, and then you progress, and then mm-hmm. you learn. I'm not saying it's perfect now, mm-hmm. but now you know you know what ikhlas is. You're doing it because you love him, and he's worthy of worship. He's worthy of the act. You're doing it because you want his reward, and you're doing it because you don't, you don't want to be thrown into his fire. Doing it for any of those reasons is ikhlas, but the ulama say doing it for all of those reasons mm. is ikhlas. And there's ways to develop your ikhlas as well. Like do a private deed every day outside of the fara'id that no one apart from you and Allah knows, mm. right? So there's, there's ways to, to deal with this, but the point is, it happens to me too. I needed awakenings, right? And sometimes someone had to be positively assertive and harsh with me, bro. And if they weren't, I mean, to be honest, bro, I don't want to praise you. Even some of the challenges that you've given me have actually helped me. Yeah? So, Thanks, man, I'll bless you for that, bro. Yeah. Likewise to you as well. Yeah, no problem. I think for our views, I, I said it to you in the previous podcast, I, I find you a good balance for me. Thank you, sir. Man, I bless you. Zakhra, I mean, I mean, so you tame the harshness and, and the aggression. Good. And sometimes I awake you, the... Yeah, you make me, you ban it. And it's good. That's what, that's <laughs> what, al-mu'min or mirat al-mu'min. The believer is a mirror, mirror of one another. Believer. Yeah, so... Uh, anyway, enough of the mushies. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> The book, The Divine Reality. Yeah. How many has it sold? Do you know? I think it's sold around nine or 10,000, I think. It's not and that many. Wagwan in Turkey, bro. <laughs> 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 what happened there? Turkey. So, see, I mean, so that's an interesting thing. So, the publisher announced that they're going to be releasing so your book. So, my book gets translated. I have to be careful with my words now, deliberately. That's yeah. fine. Now, so, be careful as you need to be, bro. Yeah, so... One of the leading publishers in Turkey, Kotimash Publishing, actually decided to translate my book. And a, a brother that we both love and yeah. we both are friends with actually translated the book. Yes. Yeah? And it's actually needed for the youth in Turkey because we think there's a big Islamic movement in Turkey. Actually, A massive atheism movement. A massive, well, 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 really, it was more of an economic movement than an Islamic movement yes, in my view. Yeah? But I don't want to get into the nuances. The that. Shi- As I said, I want to stick, in my, stick it, to my lane. It was the shifting of the middle class. Yeah. yeah so basically, um, what's interesting is the one of the... Co-editors, I believe, he sent me a private message saying, I think it even helped him. And he said, this is what's needed in Turkey. I had young kids, 18-year-olds, I think 17-year-olds saying to me, people don't believe in God in Turkey. Why, are you, taking the, why are you taking the M25 scenic route to get to the story? But, uh, why not? Because, look... You, okay, Habib, so basically the, 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 got, it got translated no, 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 no. in Turkish. And Someone the, took a snippet from a talk that you gave. Wait, let me finish. I'll give the story. So what happened was, is the minute I do some pre-marketing, yeah, yeah. pre-launch marketing, they were already waiting for me, bro, yeah, yeah. by the sounds of it. Someone took a talk I did about five, six, seven years ago in Turkey at one of the leading institutions in Turkey. It's called the Bosphorus University. Yes. Yeah? There's about 2,000 people there. The talk was nothing to do with politics mostly. It was about history, it was about proof of Islam. But you did mention Kamal Ataturk. Not really. What I said was... <laughs> you did. Your history didn't begin 80, 90 years ago. Your history began 1400 years ago. Uh, this is who you are, from what I remember. And I said, you know, don't be deluded by... And, but, but after or before that, I said, don't create an us and them with you and your secular brothers. Mm. I was really nice. I said, look, they don't know. They've been deluded by... Ideologues, ultra nationalist ideologues in 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 in, in Turkey. Turkey, and I said, don't hate on them. It's all and, binary. And I said, it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. So I was giving good advice. But that, and then after, that's reflective of Turkey's history. Yeah, they that, misquoted me, and they and well, they didn't. They quote mind me, not misquoted me. And they be and I basically said to, to cut a long story short, and you may put it in the podcast. I said, you know, <laughs> if uh, if someone. <laughs> If someone basically banned the Arabic script, banned the hijab... Bob, did you call Ataturk a shaitan? Stuff, no, and I said, is this person a friend of Allah or a friend of, or a friend of shaitan? And I let the audience answer and they said a friend of shaitan. And I said, why do you have his picture everywhere? I didn't really mention his name at all, okay. right? So people feel But like you know he's practically worshipped like a demigod. So look, by, by, let, by, let me be honest by, with you. To be very honest with you, it was five, six years ago, I wasn't in the best spiritual states. And maybe a lot of that was a little bit of my bravado and ego. Okay. However, however, you played to the audience. 
uh, probably. And may Allah forgive me. Yeah? I mean. So look. So do you do that often? I try, got, not, it, I try it, not to know. I try not to know. Came to bite you in the backside, didn't it? For your yeah, of bad, course. For your for your no no ghazi. Yeah, there's no barakah, bro. Yeah. There's no barakah if you don't do things purely for the sake of Allah. And, and, and it's a struggle for all du'at. So and do you, that's why do you regret the those early words? pious predecessors, bro, when any public action, they never considered it accepted. No, but I agree what you said yeah. about it. It was right. Listen. So and the audience responded. The way I said it was wrong because no, you. But they responded. Think about Maslaha and the. the Maybe they responded, though, didn't they? In support. A particular group. They so were pretty they, loud. This is what I should have said. They were pretty loud. Habibi, this is what I should have said. I should have said. I know you respect and value him because you're taught X, Y, and Z. He's made to be like almost an angel, right? Mm. That he saved Turkey. That he did this and he did that and all of these amazing things that you think. What I should have done is compassionately, intelligently try to create awakenings with the people. So I should say to him, look, let's have a holistic understanding. Let's understand what Islam is to us first and foremost. Forget individuals for now in history. Islam is about worshipping Allah. Talking about our, our moral philosophy, why mm. we should obey Allah. Mm. Talk about all these fundamental things. And then say, look, if anything goes against that, then that's not ethical by our own tradition. So what did Ataturk actually say? And this is well known in the historical archives. He said that Islam... Is I think it's the religion of an immoral Arab. Yeah, and he also yeah. said the Arabic language. Anyone who is led by the Arabic language is a something quite crude. I noticed that. I mean, I mean, look, everyone does mistakes, but look, and as a leader who's almost deified, I mean, he was known to to excessively drink. He was a gambler. He was actually a womanizer. He told one the, pasha, you know, "I slept with your wife yeah. just, just to these get back thing, at you." These, kind of thing. These things are well known. Yeah, but but but, but do you regret is, your words? I regret the way I said it. But you, but you would, but you would have said something like that in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think we have a moral duty as outsiders of Turkey, in some way, to create some kind of awakening, awakening in people. Because I think he's he's bordering deified, mm. right? Now, now the chemists would argue we don't deify him, yeah. But you're talking about a, a, an individual who was willing to change the word Allah mm. to Tanri, yeah. Yeah, you're talking about a person who wanted to change. Bro, they had the adhan in Turkish. Bro. I know, bro. madness. I know. Have you ever heard the adhan the in ban, Turkish? The band, the hijab. Yeah, of course. So, but but listen, but that's what we have to be. In, we have to have intellectual and spiritual empathy, emotional empathy, and be emotionally intelligent. They believe what Atatürk is did was Islam. That's the problem. Yes, mad. So, so we have to empathize. So, there's a lot of unraveling to do. He actually embodied himself as the position of Sultan of Khalifa. But that's the whole point, bro. So, I don't blame these people. And by the way, I'll go to bit. The amount of hatred I got, I've never received so much hatred in my life. Well, we just asked because you were Greek. That made it worse. But bro, they always <laughs> say things like you're a son of a prostitute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's like the nice thing compared <laughs> yeah. to everything no, no, I saw else. You sent me the screenshots. It was absolutely... But I'm saying, do you think it, it, it was more so because you were Greek? Because the, the Turkish nationalists are also known to be very racist. Look, bro, let me tell you something, yeah? I even it's like ultra-right. But I told the Turks, I, wrote, I did a response and I said to the Turks, you're my brother and sister. Even if you consider yourself a nationalist or no, a secularist. No, it's a beautiful response. Yeah, even if you consider yourself a nationalist or mm. a secularist, you're my brother. Mm. You're my sister in Islam. Irrespective of your ideological kind of positions, at the end of the day, you know, this is thicker than blood. And I was sent to them, you're my Kardesh, yeah? Seni Severum, I love you. Fine, I have a different position, historical position about a leader that you love. Fine. Maybe I might even think that you've been, you've been misinformed. Does that now mean you have to hate me? Mm. That you have to do death threats? I mean, subhanAllah, I mean, what kind of attitude is this? Is this the freedom that Ataturk preached? Is this the freedom of speech that Ataturk wanted in Turkey? Right? For my book to be banned? Right? Well, I mean, this is a massive contradiction in your own ethos, right? In your own philosophy, right? But we know many of these secular leaders, whilst they, uh, whilst they paid lip service... But that's why I, I want to make it clear, just in case any Turkish people are watching this, is that my book has nothing to do with Ataturk. My book has something to do that we all love. We all love Allah. We all want to know Allah. And we know there's a crisis of atheism and skepticism in our Muslim communities. And this is something that the Turkish community, I believe, need. And it's in the Turkish language for our youth, irrespective of ideological background. Have yeah? you found a publisher who's now going to publish it? Didn't they pull it? Hopefully they'll, they'll publish it soon. Inshallah. Inshallah. And if they don't, there are other publishers that are willing to buy out the other publisher. Yeah. Massive. Yeah, there are people who have, have uh, they, 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 they were quite principled in this issue. So just to make it clear, the way I articulated myself was wrong. But let's say the things that you attribute to Atatürk are true. Didn't Ataturk want freedom of speech in Turkey? Come on, bro. I'm just, 
I'm just I'm talking to them. Yeah. Do you see my point? If that's the case, be consistent. All I'm saying is be consistent. Mm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And yes, the way I said it wasn't right. And I agree. But my views haven't changed. I do believe uh, Atatürk, from what I have understood and what I have read, is I believe that he was an enemy of Islam. I think, the, I mean, outside of, I'll be honest with you, but I mean, I've visited Turkey now four or five times. I've actually met families. And I would say that's a sentiment, that's, actually, that's a position that's actually held by many, many, many Turks. Yeah, because they, they, they also contacted yeah, me and but, they were like, but, we're but, on your side. But, but they're scared, bro. <laughs> Yeah, of course it's because it's enshrined in Turkish law that you can't. Well, the law it. is very specific because we I had a bunch. Of, there was a bunch of barristers yeah. in Turkey that tried to show off, saying we're going to try and take Hamza to court, yeah. and I was like, you guys are just cowards yeah. because the law is very specific. Yeah. It's only for Turkish citizens. Yeah, of yeah. Course. So I was like, you know, it's just, it's just you're just showing off. Look, bring one guy went to the fight me yeah. boxing match. It was madness. That, yeah. that one week or ten days was madness. Yeah, it was absolutely crazy. But you know what? I, I think the best strategy was to keep silent. I kept silent, and although I did want to. Say things in return and no, justify I, my position, but I think from a Maslaha point of view, I made the best decision. I think I did Shura as well. I even spoke to you. I think the statement was well worth it. Yeah, I mean, but I, but I'm not apologizing for my sentiments because these are my views. Apologizing for the way but you worded it. I, I, I apologize the way I worded it. Yeah, absolutely. Look, bringing the bringing today's podcast to a close, right? Um, the book's doing well. Any other languages that's going to be translated? Yeah, so it's been translated into Turkish. It was already translated into Arabic. Yep. It's tra- which country? Which countries is it being? Do you, do you know that's being distributed? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's um, translated. It's being translated in Kurdish. Mm. It's translated in Bangla. Mashallah. It's now going to be translated translated into Urdu. Mm. It's in the process of being translated. <laughs> it's been translated into Russian. Wow. Yeah. Best doing well. Yeah. Writing anything else soon? Well, I'm just probably going to do a second edition because no book is perfect. So I'm going to try and upgrade it, make it better. I, I did a revised edition, but I'm always trying to improve the ideas. And because I, you know, as you know, I'm a, I'm a research student now, so I was, I was just going to close now. So you're pursuing yeah. further education, in academia, and is that yeah. is that just for like self validation so people can take you seriously now? Yeah, probably one of that's that's a good strategic reason. That no, but it is, isn't it? Like, yeah. like, like it's mad how a doctor in front of your name or something yeah, like this. Yeah, but to me, honest, it's also to make the arguments more robust to test them out. And let me tell you something. So since furthering, so since going to the London, the University of London, has it broadened your mind yeah. to new arguments and new angles? Yes, and in some cases, it just justified my positions as well. So, okay. for example. When you have a basic fundamental understanding of the Islamic Aqidah mm. and you go into philosophy, it's an Iman boost. But they're so close yet so far. In our seminar discussions... Give us an example. When I did, Give me an anecdotal example. So when I, when, I, when I did the Masters, what we were talking about, we were talking about... It was something to do with epistemology or something, right? Okay. About knowledge. Okay. They don't know how to define knowledge. Mm. So you have, when you do an undergrad, you learn about the true justified belief. Mm. That's knowledge, right? So you have to believe it. It has to be a representation of the state of the affairs. And you have to have justification for it. Mm. That's knowledge. But Gatia, he basically did a page and a half philosophical paper. And he produced things what are known as Gatia examples. I okay. said, well, you can, you can have something that's a representation of a state of affairs. You can have something that you believe and you can have something that you can justify, but it does, still doesn't constitute knowledge. Mad. So there's, there's still a massive kind of nuanced discussion on this. And I was like, subhanAllah, Islamic epistemology is totally different, or Absolutely. at least a certain conception of it. And I was like, you know, if only they knew, you know, and uh, we have a very, very rich tradition. Very, very have, rich tradition. Have you, have, you, have you used any opportunity whilst being at uni and, and now pursuing further uh, academia to have these conversations with lecturers? With yeah, but you've got to be careful. You have to be careful. <laughs> <coughs> because don't forget that the academy is secular, mm. right? So God is like wants to be squeezed out sometimes. But I give an example. So when we talked about evolution and, and epistemology, right? Mm. You know, can you... Can you trust your rational faculties and would it lead to true beliefs, reliable true beliefs, if they came from natural selection? No, there's no necessary connection between truth and survival Mm -hmm. because you can have untruths and still survive. For example, you could be a jungle man, go to a jungle and you could have the false belief based on unreliable rational faculties yeah. that all fungi are poisonous but that's not necessarily true 
because mushrooms are good for you. Some white button mushrooms are good for you. But you have a false belief. A magic mushroom is yeah. good for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have... Well, as a student of philosophy, it might not be bad for you. Yeah, well, uh, that's... Uh, not for you, I'm not saying for you. So, so you can have a false belief from unreliable rational faculties yeah. that lead to survival. So there's no necessary link. So the response that they have is, is evolutionary reliabilism. Fine. There's no necessary link between truth and survival. Yeah, Habib, I asked you for an anecdotal example. Well, you said they're so close but yet so far. I wanted an anecdotal example of something. Well, it was about knowledge. Like, okay. you know, they're discussing, you know, things that they should discuss, but they just, because they, because God's out of the equation. They can't and, make sense of And I'll give you an example. Consciousness. Okay. This is like the they call it the final frontier for atheism kind of thing, right? The okay. whole debates between theism and, and atheism. The hard problem of consciousness, the fact that we have inner subjective conscious states, that is a massive metaphysical issue. Science can't deal with it. Neuroscience is a science of correlations. If you knew everything about the brain, it doesn't now follow that, you know, the neurochemicals firing are identical to your inner subjective conscious states. To make that claim is a philosophical claim that requires the philosophy of the mind. You, mm. have, to, you have to justify your physicalist uh, approach. Are you a functionalist? Are you emergent and materialist? X, Y, and Z. Anyway, the reason I mentioned evolution reliabilism, not that we discussed it at like, that length. I, Look, used, you, 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 I used it as an anchor just to produce a point for the, the mm. audience. Because that's the paper that I wrote recently for my research studies. Is it available? Uh, I'm going to publish it soon. It's, it's, uh, I believe, mm. and, and I, I, I want to make this public here. Yeah? Can I do a challenge? You know, you said I don't debate anymore. Go on. I would debate anyone with certain qualifications on the fact that if you are a naturalist, philosophical naturalist, and you believe that evolution is the cause for our rational faculties, I would debate anyone on this planet, okay, on that issue. And I would show that atheism doesn't even have a foot in the door to even justify their position rationally because their worldview negates the very fact that we have reliable cognitive faculties that produce reliable and true beliefs. Massive. You heard it here first. That's it, bro. Well, I'll I'll you've not said anywhere else, right? No, it's the first time, I think. Thanks, Hamza. No problem, bro. Are you flattered? I'm from... Can you apologise for treating me really badly for the past? I've not treated you very badly. Okay, I must admit, because I lost the arm wrestle, it, it, did, it, <laughs> it, it did influence uh, the tempo of the questioning. <laughs> well, I bless you. Bro. No, this has been the bed po best podcast I've ever been on. Really? Yeah, I'll tell you, I'm not joking, bro. Can I handshake, please? Of course, Habibi. It was an absolute pleasure. I love you, bro. I, I love you, too. Exactly, I mean. Brothers and sisters, uh, that's all for today. Uh, like this video, leave a comment. You don't even have to leave a supportive comment, just leave a comment, yeah? Share the video, subscribe to the Five Pillars channel and the Mad Bomb Looks channel if you're following in North America. I love you all for the sake of Allah and for those who I even hate you for the sake of Allah as well. <laughs> nah, I didn't, I didn't, it's all love, mercy, compassion. <laughs> listen, until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Burma's podcast of Five Pillars and Mad Mom Looks production.